Hello and welcome to Learn Elixir Week 3, Module 3. In this video, we're going to go over the differences between GraphQL and REST and just introduce GraphQL a bit and how we can use it. One of the benefits of a GraphQL is that we can easily specify the returns of what we want from our API. With REST and CRUD, it gives us an object by object, and this doesn't necessarily let us specify which fields we want unless we use something like we saw in the previous video with our fields param. And our fields param must be manually implemented, which means it's going to change between different specifications of REST. The other thing with REST and it giving us our objects is that we're limited to choosing one object at a time and returning it. If we do want to choose a related field, we're again creating something that differs from the spec by using includes. And each implementation of REST it's going to have a different way of doing this. In the most basic case, you're not going to be able to exclude your keys from the includes, which is going to cause some problems if you're using mobile networks and you're expected to have low data usage. The biggest problem with REST is that the specifications change so vastly between different frameworks. In different frameworks in Node, for example, the specification changes and we have different ways of specifying for the exact same thing. And this is something that GraphQL avoids by giving us objects, and our objects can have subrelations on them, which allow us to pull the relations, and you also have to specify exactly which keys you want. And so this is what allows us to specify not only the keys we want, but the keys we want for the relations as well. In REST, we use HTTP methods to designate which type of call it is. So for our update, we use put, create we use post, delete is delete, and for all of our gets we use get. In GraphQL, this is different because we actually only use post, and all of our API hits go to post with a different query or a different mutation. REST has a lot of different things to remember, including all the HTTP methods and all the methods that you create and which objects, whereas GraphQL is quite simple and really only has one way to do things, and you have objects that are really designated for your database models. In GraphQL, we have something known as a schema. Our schema is essentially the contract between the front end and back end on what the specification looks like. Inside of our schema, we have our mutations, which are used to modify the server's data, and our queries, which are used to fetch the server's data. Both of these are sent over post. Sometimes they can also be sent over get as well, but it's more common to send it over post because it's easier to just use the data fields. In GraphQL, we have our explicit fields, which means that we're exactly choosing what we want to send to the front end. In fact, it's actually the front end who chooses what they want to pull from the back end. The other thing with GraphQL is we have a concept of types for our objects, which can be used to mimic the database so that the front end can interact with the database in a more natural way than with REST. Relations are also supported in the GraphQL spec, and we're able to use them as if they were just subfields on the type themselves, and they can get pulled out automatically, and we can choose which type of fields we want on those relations, and these can nest however deep you want. The front end can also query exactly what they need that way, and not really have to worry about having specific REST APIs to achieve certain things. And this has happened to me a lot, actually, where we've had to create different REST APIs to combine requests together or to do different things like that because the front end wanted to have one request so that we're not sending a bunch of requests over the wire. And so they requested that we combine the APIs by submitting a new REST endpoint. And this is kind of annoying because we're creating specific REST endpoints for specific use cases. And often that happens in REST where we have our specific endpoints for specific use cases and then they become hard to document and hard to find. It also leaves a lot of error room because we can forget to document which parameters are available and then all of a sudden the front end has no idea what's available for our parameters. Whereas GraphQL really solves this problem in multiple ways. One, our documentation is actually auto-generated for us with GraphQL and so we don't have to take care of our documentation for the front end to be able to use it in order to read what the spec is and what our schemas with all of our mutations and queries are, as well as what all the return types for those mutations and queries 
and the arguments itself. The front end is also able to batch queries together as well as mutations, which allow it to specify exactly what it wants in a single request without us having to modify our code in any way whatsoever. There's also a UI tool that comes with GraphQL in most cases called GraphEQL, and that's graph with an I, QL, and that's a UI tool that allows us to test our queries as well as read the docs themselves. There's a bunch of different applications out there that are graph EQL implementations that allow you to input a URL and play around with the GraphQL schema that gets outputted. This is due to GraphQL having an introspection query that basically allows the client to introspect all the types that are available on a GraphQL API, as well as all the mutations and queries that are also available. This is what a GraphQL query looks like, and you can see that it's quite simple. Essentially, we have our query that has our user object that we're pulling back, and in that, we're passing an argument because we want the name to be Bob. And from that user, we're pulling off the ID and the name. This is very simple and is very expressive. In a more complex example, we have our query which we name find user, and we assign the name to a string and the ID to an ID. And so when the front end says something like this, they're also type checking those variables to make sure that before they send them to the back end, they match the types that we see in the query. The exclamation mark after the type simply means that it's required. So if we remove that exclamation mark, say from ID, the ID would no longer be required. Or if we remove it from both, you could alternatively choose whether you wanted to send the name or the ID, even with this one query, it would support both. The other thing that we see in this query is that we're also including the address object with just the country. And so this is our expressive way of specifying the specific relations that we want to come back in our query and exactly what fields we want from that relation. As I said before, this can also be nested as much as you want. So if you had multiple objects that were deeper, say the address has a country which has a bunch of codes, you could specify the object country and put code underneath that. Here's an example of what a GraphQL mutation looks like, and it's not too much different. The basic idea is that we have our mutation keyword instead of our query keyword, and that we're naming our mutation update user. And in our mutation, we pass in the ID and the name, and they are both required. And so then we have our mutation name which is update user and just passes in the ID and the name and we're pulling off the ID and name in response. One of the interesting things about GraphQL is because it's meant to be used with JavaScript is it's actually in camel case. Even though for us in Elixir, it's going to be snake case, the front end still interacts with that in their native case, which is camel case. Some of the interesting parts of GraphQL also include fragments in which we can specify a fragment that belongs to a type with a bunch of different fields on it. And then if we have our fragments, we can simply reuse them along queries and simply specify that fragment name in order to pull the fields from that fragment out of the query. Other things that we have include our type checks that come from the front end when they declare their GraphQL queries and mutations with the types. They actually check that type before they send that data to us if they're using a library such as Apollo, which is the most common front-end library to use. Some other cool things that we have available to us is our queries and mutations can actually be separated out into completely separate files in the front-end and then be linted so that the front-end is actually aware of any problems in their query without us needing to tell them where their query went wrong. We also have autocomplete in GraphQL, which allows us to build queries inside of a UI and to get our queries auto-completed for us so that it's easier to build. In short, GraphQL really helps to alleviate some of the problems that we see in REST and can help us to create better applications where the front end is in more control of how they specify the data they want and how they interact with the data. Because our mutations are simple and named, instead of trying to force our CRUD application and REST together to work with what we need, we can actually specify individual mutations with names that don't necessarily match. For example, we could say send email as a mutation that sends an email. And because it's documented well, it doesn't necessarily need to follow the same standard of CRUD 
or have the complexity of a REST API behind it. Now that we know a bit about the differences between GraphQL and REST, in the next video, we're going to go over creating a GraphQL API with Phoenix. So I'll see you in the next video.